Hey everyone, so I'm Tesla Herbert, and today we have Warren Redlich in the house. Woohoo! Hello. So Warren, Warren is, I'm very sure many of you know him. He's well known in Twitter, Tesla community. It's hard to not know Warren. Uh, he's got quite a popular Twitter account under the handle at Warren for New York Governor at WR4NYGOV. We're going to find out a little bit more about that. That's going to be wonderful to hear the story about how he ran as the Libertarian candidate uh, for the governor of New York in 2010. Very exciting. And of course, you must know about his YouTube channel. If you haven't, please check him out. You can simply find him at Warren Redlich. He's got 66,000 followers now, and he's just uh, absolutely amazing, brilliant, intelligent, um, uh, and, and just full of just just can't just always has something to say has an opinion about things all the full time. of something <laughs> full of something so he's previously a criminal defense lawyer um he was the founder of fair dui so i'm absolutely excited to hear more about what that is since then he's become an investor in both tesla and amazon and not just any old investor he's actually what we would call in the community as an uber bull uh, for Tesla. So I want to hear more about your thesis, uh, how it differs from mine. I'm a long-term investor as well, but you're an uber bull. So welcome, Warren. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So first things first, Warren, um, as I asked people and told them that I'm going to interview you, a couple people had mentioned the same thing, which is they've actually not seen you laugh before. <laughs> so apparently folks have never seen you laugh. So as you would say, let's go, Warren. <laughs> Just just get it out of the way. Get it done. Get a laugh or give you the let's go? No, you got to do the laugh. And then you say, let's go. I, you know, that's funny. I, I, I think I laugh. I went to a comedy. Well, laugh now. You should ask Ellie in space, El Eliana Sheriff, because I went to a comedy club with her and I'm pretty sure I laughed at the Mormon jokes. We were in Salt Lake City. Okay. So if you have Mormon jokes for me, tell me a Mormon joke. <laughs> Tell me a Jewish joke. Had, Tell me a joke. Just laugh on call. call is kind of not that easy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go. You, gotcha. Let's talk about, let's go right to the fun part right away. Um, so with regards to your investment um, in Tesla, your due diligence, you are considered an Uber bull. So you've done countless YouTube uh, videos where you share your target is that by 2030, you are seeing Tesla at $40,000 a share. So let's talk about that. Or higher. A little bit more. <laughs> no, my, let's that. be clear. My bear yeah. case for Tesla in 2030 is $8,000 a share. That's if everything goes wrong. Yeah. Um, but my upside case, you know, depending on things like FSD and bot, you could easily hit $100,000 a share. I think 40000 is sort of a rough where I think it will be if everything goes as expected. I love this. This is uh, music to my ears, music to everyone um, who are Tesla investors. But let's walk it through. I know you've got your spreadsheets. I know you've thought this through, but just high level, walk us through the folks who haven't heard your thesis on this. Sure. I mean, it, it, you have to look at what Tesla's doing. So the, the basic is just, let's just suppose they make cars. They don't achieve FSD. They don't achieve bot. And, and they, right. they do um, battery storage and grid storage. Okay. And the base model that I use, I call the battery revenue model. And Elon actually mentioned something very similar to it during an investor call. I got all these messages from people. Hey, Warren, Elon's using your model. Like, no, I think Elon had the model first and I guessed yeah. it. But um, you look at how many batteries that Tesla uses in its products right. in, in gigawatt hours. And then you say, okay, how much money do they make per kilowatt hour? Let's start with that. Let's imagine a hypothetical Tesla Model 3 that has a 50 kilowatt hour pack. They don't, they don't make a 50 kilowatt hour pack for Model 3. I think they start at 60. But just to make numbers simple, let's assume a hypothetical Model 3, 50 kilowatt hour pack. They sell it for $30,000. Now, they don't sell any car as cheap as $30,000. Now, when I created the, the story, it was $30,000. That works out to $600 a kilowatt hour. Okay. Okay. So you start with that $600 a kilowatt hour. If you assume that all their products are priced at $600 a kilowatt hour, then you ask, well, how many batteries will they, will they use in products in 2030? Hmm. Now they said they were shooting for three terawatt hours in 2030. It wasn't clear hmm. what they meant at the time. I thought they were saying they were going to produce three terawatt hours of batteries. And then going along with it, they would acquire three terawatt hours in batteries from suppliers. You'd have six terawatt hours. 
So you take $500 a kilowatt hour. That's $500,000 a megawatt hour. That's $500 million a terawatt hour. No, sorry. That's $500 million a gigawatt hour. That's $500 billion a terawatt hour. (laughs) Okay. okay. So if you do three terawatt hours, you got $1.5 trillion in revenue. Well, that's a big company. Okay. And you, st- and then you say, okay, what's the profit margin? You can, you can kind of work. What's a good price to sales ratio for a company that's growing like yeah. that. And that gets you to the $8,000 share price. Pretty, pretty straightforward. You can use a profit model. You could say, all right, how much money, how much are they making in profit on each vehicle? You could take that approach and you could break it down by vehicle and by product. But like, so Powerwall and Megapack, I think, are a little bit less per kilowatt hour. But at the same time, like with Powerwall, you add in solar panel revenue that typically goes with Powerwall, and you actually get a higher dollars per kilowatt hour. So you're left with Megapack that's somewhat lower per kilowatt hour. But Mm. when you add it up, you still end up, and keep in mind, I just said $30,000 for a Model 3. Now you can, you're struggling to get a Model 3 for $50,000. Yeah. Right, so fifty thousand dollars on a fifth on let's say a, a seventy five kilowatt hour pack or an eighty kilowatt hour pack, you're getting to more than six hundred dollars so a kilowatt hour. You're taking um, Elon for his word that they're going to hit three terawatts per hour. It's not just Elon; it's Drew Baglino as well. So, what's the likelihood, though? But that's uh, wait, wait. That out. was that was just selling products. That was no FSD. That was no bot. Yeah, no, that no, was no AI nothing. training as a service. That was you know, there's all kinds of other things that are going on at Tesla that are under the radar right now for most people. That's, but, but there's it, a battery shortage right now, right? There's a supply sure. chain issue. So what's the likelihood today that they're still on track to making all those batteries, whether in-house well, and or through suppliers? So my understanding is they are not battery constrained this year. They are chip right. constrained this year. They'll be battery constrained next year, maybe. Right. Um, I think they're ramping production of 4680. It's struggling a little bit, but they will get 4680 production going. Right. Um, so... At lithium iron phosphate battery production is growing like by gang, like gangbusters from CATL. Mm-hmm. Um, I I think the battery issue is there. It's a it's a limitation down the road, but I think that problem gets solved by 2030. We're in 2022 now. And there's a lot of time. Lithium? Yeah. Well, there's lithium. Drew Baglino talked about possibly using sodium based batteries in the future for grid storage. There, there's a lot of different solutions to this problem. But you know the your 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 question assumes that that Tesla isn't able to accomplish something in eight years when we've seen a history of Tesla and SpaceX and Elon companies accomplishing things that other companies don't accomplish. But again, we're leaving out like what happens if they nail FSD? What happens yeah. if they deliver on bot? What happens if they deliver AI training as well, a so, service? So, okay, so that, that's you looked at it from a battery. That sounds really good, Warren. By the way, that's a very well, first no. And listen, approach. listen, I'm saying. If you, if you just follow the battery revenue model and you just right. do three terawatt hours, right. you're already effectively at $8,000 a share. Exactly. Okay, with a reasonable... No, I, I got pr- that. So, with, but then, so now, but then you have to... Now you take a step back and say, well, what if they only make two terawatt hours? Oh, dear, right. they're only at $5,500 a share. Oh, yeah, I'm yeah. crying. No, I, I get that. So I love that you do the battery approach, which is first principles yeah. thinking. But then what about the issue of, well, they can make all the batteries they want, but what if the competition arrives, which is what lots of people think? <laughs> There you go. There's the laughter. The laughter came. You got. You found it. <laughs> I found yeah, it. that's so, how do you get Warren laugh? Say the competition is coming. <laughs> so I'm just repeating what I hear other people say that you can yeah, only yeah. you can only sell. Wait, where, let's where, say wait, wait. Weren't you just saying that Tesla's going to have trouble getting batteries? Where are the other guys getting batteries? That's right. I, I hey, I'm on your side. I'm just where are the other guys through your thing. Why is it that Tesla has a problem getting batteries, but the competition doesn't? Okay, well, that's... Okay. No, nobody okay. else in the competition is making their own batteries except for BYD. What, what percentage of all new EV cars do you project Tesla being able to accommodate? If, if it's in your model, like 20%, that's a very... I, I actually number. don't think about an EV market. I think the EV mar- the concept of EV market share is a fiction that is perpetrated by... I love, I love Gary Black, but he's addicted to this EV market share concept. A lot of analysts are addicted to some sort of notion of an EV. Look, Tesla sells yeah. every car they make. The question yeah. is, how many cars can they make? They'll sell every every mega pack, every power all they make. The question is how many they can make. There is no demand problem. The, the notion that there's this market share issue assumes that there's some sort of demand problem. And we can see it right now. 2030. No. Why? People don't, I don't people actually want, believe it too. By the people way. won't want cars anymore. Look, they, listen, I, drive, look, I have a Model 3. 
from 2018. It's better than any car I've ever driven in my life until I got my new Plaid X. And my new Plaid X is like, I can't believe right. they're allowed to sell this. It's so fast. It's, and it's so luxurious. And it's so com- they, they make the best cars on the planet by far. Yeah. The competition is comical. Okay. I mean, it's just, it's just so, yeah, yeah. so you look out to 2030 and you say, all right, Tesla's selling 20 million cars. And you're like, well, what's, that's impossible. They can't possibly sell 20 million cars. Well, what's the global market for cars going to be? Now, there's a scenario where that doesn't happen, I think. Okay, maybe. The scenario where it doesn't happen is they deliver robo-taxi and people stop buying yeah, cars. Yeah. Okay. But even yeah, then... Yeah. Which is what I think. Which but is what I but think even then, yeah. private sector, you know, fleet operators will buy self-driving, will buy the cars, or Tesla will just operate their own fleet. So they'll still make 20 million cars yeah, and they'll still put them into productive use. So 20 million cars, well, that's crazy, Warren. That would be, you know, 20% of the, of the overall car market. So, you know, and, and, and the problem that people don't get, people say, mm. well, you can't sell that many cars because you don't have enough models. And it's like, yeah, that, look, before, before the iPhone came out, this is an iPhone XR, right. but, you know, remember the original iPhone? Yeah. iPhone doesn't, Apple does not have a lot of variety in its iPhones. They don't have 20 different versions of an iPhone. There's lots of versions of Android phones, yeah. but who's got a big chunk of the market and who makes most of the profits? Apple. Yeah. So if you accept that a Tesla is that level of difference from other phones, which I believe it is, then you don't have an issue. It, it's, yeah. it's dramatically different. You know, like, you know, you can... <laughs> It's in sentry mode, and you can look at the, what what, your, what the cameras around your car from anywhere in the world, yeah. right? I mean, that, yeah, so that, I, that's I, stunning. You know, I think the base case, like you said, is twenty percent of the market, but the reality of the, is of the entire car market is not coming. Of the entire and they can car market, actually get the whole entire car exactly. I 20, agree. Like, I, I, I'm, on, I'm your side. Look, I'm this idea side. that there's an EV market share is like, well, what percentage of the EV market did Tesla have at the beginning? Tesla isn't <laughs> Tesla isn't taking EV market share from other companies. They're taking market right. share from internal combustion engine companies, exactly. from Ford and General Motors and Toyota and Volkswagen. Yeah. They, the idea that somebody else is going to cut into Tesla's EV market share is like, look, the other car companies have like 98% of the market. Who's trying to take 2% of the market when there's 98% to grab? If you make a great AV, AV are you going to try to take market share from 2% of the market or market share from 98% of the market? Uh, you'd have to be an idiot to go after Tesla. Well, I, think, I think we all agree today that EVs is, you know, it's already taken over. I think the statistic this morning I saw was that in China, it's already at uh, 50%. So, well, it's, you know, once you, I, I, I will say this, once you drive a Tesla, it's hard to drive a gas car. I, I know it. We all know it. Um, I, 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 I occasionally have to drive, uh, I had to drive a Volkswagen Passat up to, <laughs> my old Volkswagen Passat to trade it in for my Tesla Model X. And it's like, oh my God, people drive these things? I used to love driving that car. Yeah. Um, well, and- you know, it, but it's the same thing about Apple, right? There's a bunch of people who will never buy an Apple just because. And so that's why there's Android. And yes, there could be a version of a car that's opposite of Tesla that can get market share. But like I say, the base case is Tesla only gets 20%. The, the comp- competition comes, they figure this out and there's it's equivalent. They get twenty percent, but even then, it's already that's ten times uh, what we are today. Well, so I, I, I'll, I'll put this another way: uh-huh. which other company poses a significant threat of producing more than a million well, the Chinese, EVs? The Chinese companies, right? Um, I don't think any of them is on a path to a million EVs yet. Neo, Neo did a hundred thousand, I think, total. Um, I think Neo is the biggest. Not, I, not a, I'm not saying selling it to the U.S. I'm saying in, in the world. I'm right? talking about total production. I don't think any Chinese EV company is anywhere close to Tesla now, and mm-hmm. Tesla's growing fast. Yeah, I wouldn't. Neo I, has that ne- would be the one company I wouldn't discount. The no, country I would not discount. No, look, right? Neo's going to go and yeah, no, look, Neo shows promise. BYD shows promise. Yeah, uh, X Peng maybe shows promise. There's like one or two other companies that show promise, but none of them is producing at Tesla scale, and Tesla's right growing fast. Yeah. I agree. And the, the, the thing that people forget as well is that, oh, they're going to catch up. All right, I'll give you five years. Well, where's Tesla going to be in five years, though? They're going to per- perpetually always be catching what was up. The, right? There was the awesome. claim that Volkswagen was going to produce more cars than yeah. Tesla in 2024 when Volkswagen is going to supposedly produce 2 million vehicles, which, number one, Volkswagen is not going to produce 2 million EVs in 2024. And number two, we should do. Tesla is yeah, going to produce should. 2 million vehicles next year. 
if two and a half million views next year. Side by side, one is like Elon saying FSDs coming, FSDs coming, FSDs coming, and then on the other side is you know Volkswagen's gonna you know <laughs> gonna get twenty five million and twenty five. No, and more. look, Volkswagen's doing something. I think they supposedly delivered four hundred thousand EVs last year, but yes. I think a large chunk of those were in the Chinese market and were not yeah. really. Full, you know, full electric vehicles like, you know, the VW ID4 is a genuine electric vehicle, right? That I, I think some of the vehicles they're counting are like low end vehicles that are, you know, not on the same scale as something like a Tesla or a Volkswagen ID4. I'm, I'm not sure exactly where their 400,000 number came from because they didn't deliver 400,000 ID4s. So I, I, I just don't see it. I mean, Kia's, Kia and Hyundai are producing some EVs, but nobody's producing at this scale and nobody's growing at the same at the same rate. I love it. Okay, so your Uber bull position is strictly based on no, battery. No, no, that's my bear case. That's your bear case. I got gotcha. you. That's I my gotcha. bear case. That's your bear case. When, then when if you, you go to yeah. FSD, if yeah, Tesla delivers FSD. FSD and robo taxis, now you ask yeah. yourself the question, okay, let's suppose, let's take a simple early situation. Let's yeah. suppose you have a million robo taxis on the road. Let's start with one robo taxi, okay? How many miles does the robo taxi drive in a year? Okay. Mm -hmm. it, it operates about 18 hours a day. Okay. Mm -hmm. It operates from roughly uh, 6 a.m. to midnight and charges somewhere. And there's just not, there's no demand between midnight and 6 a.m. Or, or nearly zero demand between midnight and 6 a.m. And, and largely in most of the world, there's certain cities where there's some activity till right. two or four in the morning, but by and large, there's nearly zero. And I mean, I've, I've walked the streets in New York city at 2 a.m. And there's not a whole lot going on at 2 a.m. in New York city even. Mm -hmm. So figure there's an 18 hour window where they have a significant amount of demand and the car averages 20 miles an hour. So the car drives mm -hmm. 360 miles a day. It works mm -hmm. out to about a hundred thousand miles a year. Are you with me uh, so far? Yeah, sure. And let's say about 60% of those miles are paid miles versus the car going from one ride to another. You mm -hmm. figure the network is able to optimize. So it's not just 50% occupied, it's 60% occupied. So yeah. hundred, so 60,000 miles are paid. I'm probably underselling it a little bit. It's probably a little more than 60,000 miles for a couple of reasons, but let's go with 60,000 miles paid. What's the rate, right? Mm -hmm. Right now, Uber is Uber and Lyft are around $253 dollars a mile. So you undercut them and you do a dollar fifty a mile. Yeah. Or two. If you do two dollars a mile, right in the he early said days. Said the price of a bus. I think he. Well, down the bus. road when. There's a whole issue with pricing of Uber, robo taxis. We'll come to that in a minute, maybe. But let's start with two dollars a mile. Two dollars a mile times sixty thousand miles is one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year in revenue for this vehicle. Yeah. Now, what's the operating cost? Well, it's one hundred thousand right. miles, and the operating cost is about fifteen cents a mile, right? All in, you know, amortizing the yeah. car, electricity, insurance. Well, there's really, I mean, Tesla's going to have to self-insure, but let's let's call it call it fifteen cents a mile. So you got fifteen thousand dollars in expenses on one hundred and twenty thousand dollars in revenue. So you made one hundred and five thousand dollars in revenue on one car. Okay. Now you do a million of them. Now you just made a hundred billion dollars in revenue <laughs> on a million cars. Just a million cars. A uh, yeah. hundred billion dollars in revenue. And that's with just a million. Well, Tesla's going to be producing by 2030, Tesla's going to be producing 20 million vehicles a year. Okay. Yeah. So this is now, you, those, uh... now push it to a fleet of 10 million yeah. and drop the price from $2 to $1. Okay. Now you've got a trillion dollars in revenue, a trillion dollars in profit. Sorry. Okay. Somewhere down the road, the, the robo taxi model that they're going to come out with in 2024, that's probably going to have a lower cost per mile. That's probably going to be 10 cents a mile or less. So you save a little bit on that end as well. But you go from, from 1 million vehicles to 10 million vehicles, you drop the price from 2 million to one, uh, from $2 a, a mile to $1 a mile. You end up with a trillion dollars in profit. A trillion, a trillion dollars in profit. <laughs> profit. Okay. Now a trillion, a trillion dollars in profit, yeah. with a price earnings ratio of thirty, <laughs> right? Which I think yeah. is low. Is well, a thirty course. trillion dollar market cap. That's of course. that's a trillion dollars in profit, not considering any other way the company makes money, <laughs> right? And then you can say, all right, now you go from ten million robo taxis. To sure. 100 million robo taxis. It's crazy. And the market. And, and this the, is one the, of those things where. And yeah, you drop the price a again. could take all. And, yeah, and you drop the price all. again from a, from from a dollar a vehicle to 25 cents a mile, which is what people are saying ultimately the cost of robot. That's what Kathy Wood says. Yeah, the ultimately yeah, I was the price. Ask you, how does your? I think it's probably higher than. Is, I think it's probably higher than 25 cents a mile. But call it 25 cents a mile. Then what? Kathy and figure Wood, 10 cents a mile. Invest, yeah. 
right, what did right. they model? But I'm just saying, if you if, if you end up with 15 cents a mile in profit mm-hmm. times 100 million vehicles, I, I'm sorry, yeah, you end up with 15 cents a mile, um, fifteen thousand dollars in profit times. You, you end up with like fifteen trillion dollars in profit. It, it's the, it, you just end up with these insane numbers. Absolutely, right. I agree. I, I, it's one. It's a bet, and I think it's going to happen. You think it's going to happen, but people are still discounting it. And then you get to buy. It's going to happen. And then let's <laughs> not talk to there. <laughs> no, if you go to Tesla bot, you're like, well, what's the market for bot? I mean, the funny I, thing is that the bot is actually more likely to happen. It's actually easier to make it work, I think, than the, the auto autopilot. But, you know, obviously real world AI and being able to navigate the world, but it's less of a, a leap. Well, let's let's just talk about bot for a second. Here's the thing. Like my, my example of how bot works is you run a Burger King or a McDonald's and you have 10 yeah. employees on duty at any given moment. It's probably an exaggeration, but I'm just like trying to like give a simple, I like using simple numbers. So 10 is a simple yeah. number. So let's suppose you have some kind of small business. It's easy for me to, because I worked at Burger King as a kid and Dairy Queen as a kid. <laughs> it's easy for me to conceptualize Burger King and McDonald's. I think most people have been to Burger King and McDonald's a lot. And let's just suppose they have 10 employees on at a time, which they probably yeah. have fewer than that, but call it 10. If you can have a bot do enough of the tasks, the routine tasks that people do, that you can run the place with only nine employees you ju- and, and two shifts because bot doesn't get tired, right? So a regular employee works 2,000 hours a year. The bot works 4,000 hours a year. If you're able to save one employee's time and those employees make $10 an hour, Just right? One, yeah. Which And then really the cost of $10 an hour is $15 an hour to the employer because the employer has to pay a bunch of things to, to manage the employees. You end up with a value of four thousand hours times fifteen dollars an hour of sixty thousand dollars a year from a bot that probably costs about five thousand dollars to make and probably lasts ten mm-hmm. years, mm-hmm. right? So, all right, your Burger King, you're willing to pay thirty, forty thousand dollars minimum for something that's going to save you sixty thousand dollars, right? You're going to pay forty, thirty, forty thousand dollars a year for something that's going to save you sixty thousand dollars. right? And this is at the early days when it's only able to do bare bones tasks like cleaning the floor. Right. You know, you're, you're not, it's not tra- doing transactions with customers. It's not doing the burger flipping, right? It's taking the garbage out to the dumpster. It's cleaning the floors. It's keeping the, you know, it's doing really simple tasks over time with AI, with machine learning, it learns new tasks and maybe it replaces two workers and maybe it's able to do jobs that are worth more than $10 an hour. Right. But just with that, you know, how many, you know, how many jobs are there like that? And, and it, it's astonishing. And then you, you assume that it's going to learn and it's going to be able to do $12 an hour jobs, $20 an hour jobs. What about roofing? You know, Elon said dangerous, repetitive, yes. and boring. And That's you got 10 guys working on a roof and you're able to replace one of them with a bot doing some of the work. Maybe you're able to replace two of them. And that's probably like $20, $30 an hour work. And, and that saves lives too. This is important. Don't forget this. You have the bot doing the most dangerous stuff. Right, that saves you because people fall off roofs when they're doing roofing jobs and they get hurt really bad. So, as you can train bot to do more and more tasks, it starts to learn to do things that are dangerous. It saves human lives. So, and, and the value, you know, of that bot, you know. So anyway, the point is that if if the bot does ten dollar an hour work that's really worth fifteen dollars an hour and it generates fifty thousand dollars a year in revenue for ten years, that's five hundred thousand dollars a bot. Right, and then. What's the what's the 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 market yeah. the market for bot? It's like a billion. Yeah. There's yeah. probably a billion of them. You yeah. know, maybe it's a hundred million a year. Maybe equal. Yeah, a hundred million a year times fifty thousand dollars. You, you just end up with this insane number. And really, there's kind of no upper limit because there are a lot of jobs that that just don't get done. Yeah, because it's too hard to find the labor for it. Um, and then there's space. Like if you're sending a mission to Mars, you're going to send a million people to Mars. How many bots do you think you're going to have on Mars? Every person's yeah. going to have 10 bots, right? The yeah. moon. I, I do think that SpaceX will be the first customer. They'll just order 10,000. Tesla and you know, SpaceX right will be early customers. But you know, if you're, if you're going to launch to, the, to Mars, the, the, a, a, a launch payload that could hold 100 humans could probably hold 10,000 bots, at least 1,000 yeah. bots. They don't need space. They don't need air. Right. They probably need to be kept a little <laughs> bit warm. You know, the life yes. support for bot is, is totally different. So it's right. Uh, and you know, so if you sense. if you want to do work on the Martian surface or the lunar surface, oh, you sure. want as much yeah. of that done by bots as possible so you don't risk human lives. <laughs> so I mean, you know, that then you say, all right, what's well, the moon? It's Mars, it's you know, we're going into yeah. space. 
Uh, there's a lot of potential for bot there. I still think on earth is where most of the value creation is. So, yeah. you know, you, yeah. you follow that path of robo taxi and bot and you can get to a hundred, hundred thousand yeah, dollars a share I, quickly. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Very, yeah. very cool. I interviewed Dave so, Lee and I was asking him about bot. He, he's so yeah. conservative all the time. He's so restrained. And I asked him about bot and he almost cried when he, he <laughs> see, because he sees the potential. The potential is just basically unlimited for bot. It's, it's unlimited, yeah, for sure. And that's what I'm saying, that actually I do think that bots are actually easier path, if anything. Um, it's going to be faster and quicker than we all realize. Well, bot, the challenge with bot as compared to, so all that Tesla, that robot, that FSD has to do is navigate space. It has to move within, you have to identify a space and move within it. And it's a fairly limited space that has to move within its roads. Right. And maybe dirt roads and maybe there's parking lots, whatever. There's a fairly limited space that, that FSD has to operate in. Bot has to operate in more spaces and it has to manipulate objects. FSD yeah. does not have to manipulate objects and learning to manipulate objects. I, I just saw Dave Lee was interviewing James Dowman. James Dowman said, let me know when Bot can pick up a cat. Yeah, I gotcha. Yeah. And I just watched this uh, uh, interview by Robert Scoble on giant AI CEO, and he has a role of te uh, bots and they're manipulating objects. They're grabbing a bear ball bearing and putting it down to this ramp and it's learning. But you're right. A cat is something very different. Of course, you, you got to be. No, no, but it's, it's also like typically when you see those bots, those robots doing those tasks, they're doing it in a very constrained environment. And they have specific programming how to do it. I, I don't know how much of that is machine learning and how much of that is direct programming. So like the Boston yes, Dynamics okay. robots are just yes. directly programmed, do this, do this, do this. It's, it's human coded movements. Machine learning is a totally different game. If it can learn, hey, pick up that ball over there and it looks around and it sees a ball and a box and a tree and it knows which one's the ball and it goes and picks it up and it knows yeah. how to pick it up and bring but it back. That's that's yeah. a totally different game. But what like you're saying is that that's the future. And right at the beginning, they can take you know, minimal steps and it can't do everything, but it can only clean the floor. That's well, it. let me give you an example of a really simple job for bot. OK, yeah. you have a, a factory or some other property yeah. that that you want to protect. You want to have some right. level of protection. Yeah, you can only you know, you could hire security guards to walk the property. But you could have one central security guard and you could have bots walking the property and the bots right. don't interact when the bots encounter something that's suspicious. They just alert the central security guard. Hey, this is what I see. And maybe the security guard tells them to say something or maybe the security guard just has a response team to, to respond to where the bot is. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the bot doesn't doesn't even all it has to do is walk around the property and, and look and uh, identify objects and identify potential threats. Right. That's a fairly simple task. And that's a pretty valuable task. That's probably more than a ten dollar an hour job, right. and so that, all it's just doing is walking out on the property. Doesn't have to manipulate kind of objects, around. right? Yeah. Maybe just has doors. to navigate. Just has walking to navigate away. space. Maybe it has to open doors. Maybe the doors. Open. Yeah, but you know, yeah. it's walking around the exterior. That's Maybe right. it has to go through a gate. Um, that and so you. Could, I, there's a huge market for that. It, yeah, the others will all learn it as well instantly. Yeah. So yeah, it's uh, <laughs> awesome. Okay, so let's uh, let's jump right to your story. I want to hear more from you? Where you where did you grow up? Um, uh, what's your what's your yeah just your general study? What did you study, and how did you become a lawyer? Sure. I mostly grew up in the Albany, New York area, in the town of mm -hmm. Gilderland. Uh, I which is a great place to be a kid, just to say that. And let my experience, it was a great place to grow up. Um, I went to college at Rice University in Houston, Texas. Studied mathematical economics. I chickened out on engineering and studied mathematics. Economics is what you study when you chicken out on engineering. <laughs> okay, I then went yeah. to grad school at Stanford for three years, got a master's degree in political science, was gunning for a PhD and uh, just wasn't oh. going to happen. Went yeah. to law school in my hometown. Where my father was a law professor, so I went to my hometown law school. Um, graduated from that. There were, it was a bad year to graduate law school. I taught English in Japan for a year. You did? Ca yes. Wow. Came back to Albany, got a job working for a nurse's union for six months. That didn't work out too well. Uh, then I found a job working for the Allstate Insurance Company as a trial lawyer. Did okay. that for three go. years and roughly three months. Then I got a job working for a judge who I'd practiced in front of as a lawyer. Did that for about three, three years and three months. And then I started my own law firm, which okay. I recently retired as a lawyer. So I ran my law firm from 2003 till last year, basically, uh, maybe this year. Um, and 
Along the way, I started up a website called towncourt.com with a hyphen between town and court that was fairly successful, was making me a, a good amount of money, and I was able to retire as a lawyer and move to Florida. We, uh, my then wife hated winter. What, what does town court do? It's a directory of traffic and criminal courts. It's, just a, it's a search engine optimized directory of traffic and criminal courts. So when people Google Gilderland town court, it mm. used to rank very high in a search result. And I would have advertising on it. So I was making money on Google ads and I had direct attorney advertisers and I advertised myself. Wow. Um, okay. And it still makes a little bit of money, but not as much. It kind of declined the age let's of cell phones. Let's pause for a second there, Warren. Let's yeah. pause for a second. So you 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 look like a person who's very determined, who's got kind of got things planned out, but then you took a detour to Japan and then you even did- I never had anything planned well. out. Nothing planned out? No, I, I just totally, I've been winging it from the beginning. <laughs> love it. Tell me, so how did you make that decision to go, I'm going to spend a year, a sabbat, is it a sabbatical? What do you call that? Just I had, when I was at Stanford, I had a girlfriend who was Japanese. Her English was better than mine. She, she, she spoke the Queen's English, but uh, okay. <laughs> that got me interested in Japan. And I took Japanese classes while I was at Stanford. And then I went to law school and I still had this Japan bug in me. And yeah. I was talking to friends who were in Japan and I was coming out of law school. There were no jobs. And this one friend of mine said, well, why don't you come over here and stay with me for, and while you look for a job? And I stayed with him for a month and found a job in Hiroshima teaching English at a Kaiwa, right. what was it? English Academy um, yeah. in Hiroshima, Japan. And I taught there for a year and then I came back. Uh, so I, I, yeah, that, this, this is, the, I never had a plan. I mean, I, I always had ideas of what I wanted to do, but you know, you just, I just sort of followed the way the wind blew. Nice. And then when you were already a lawyer and then you decided to start this website, just a new oh, business, so, did you hire people to do it for you or how did you? Yeah, I paid somebody to do to some of the work. I think I started building it myself and then at some point I paid somebody to make it scalable because um, yeah. I was just hand coding it in HTML and I paid somebody <laughs> to make it like scalable with a database. But um, so I had a web, a page on my lawyer website, uh, Courts We Cover actually more than one mm. page indicating what courts we covered. And I saw on my website that I was getting a lot of traffic when people were Googling um, court names. So I built a directory of court. I figured, okay, people are looking for information on courts. A lot of courts don't have websites. This is you know, yeah. back in the day when a lot of courts didn't have websites, a lot of lawyers didn't have websites. So I started building a directory of courts and it worked. I started getting a lot of traffic. I advertised myself. I got business. I built it bigger. All of a sudden it covered the whole country. I paid people wow. to enter data, to research and enter data. And it was, you know, there's, there's a, there were, I had techniques to make it better, better quality and, and more search engine optimized. And it was successful for a while. So. And then were you always interested in technology or yes. it was just a business idea? And no, that, no, I was always, got you there. middle school, mm -hmm. I was doing computer programming at middle school on a Commodore 4K pet. I wrote a, <laughs> I wrote a really bad version of a Pac-Man game. Uh, you know, okay. I, 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 I go back to the days of the game artillery, um, which artillery. Yeah. So it's the, I don't go back to Fortran cards, but I go back to, <laughs> I, I go back to programming and basic on 4k Commodore 4k pet. old, but not as old as the cards. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't quite, quite just miss the Fortran card era. <laughs> okay. That's pretty cool. And then, so as a lawyer, uh, you, you started something called fair DUI. Can you explain that one? That sounds really cool. Sure. Um, fair DUI yeah. was kind of like a, an interesting experiment. So I handle a lot of drunk driving cases. Um, and what a lot of people don't realize is a lot of people accused of drunk driving are actually innocent. And that's, Ooh. that's a hard pill to swallow. And a lot of people are going to hear that and say, Oh no, that's not true. Okay. Uh, a lot of people are actually, I'm not saying half, but a significant portion, 10%, roughly 10% of, of people arrested in Florida for DUI blow illegal blood alcohol content. They register illegal blood alcohol content. And then they're still, they're still, they're, they're still charged with DUI and their mugshot is still put up on the internet, even though they're innocent. Oh, okay. they're, they're objectively oh, okay. innocent at the, at, the, at the breath test and they're still charged. Blow 0.000, oh, okay. they're going to put your mugshot on the interset, uh, internet and tell the world you've been uh, charged with drunk driving. Um, so there's a lot of injustices in the DUI system. And I, I, and I wrote a book about it. So I did it for years and I was so motivated by it that I wrote a book called Fair DUI, which you can oh, find so on Amazon. This is your own book. You actually wrote this book. Yes. I published this book. Wow. Um, and then, uh, after that, one of the, one of the lessons that every lawyer will tell you is keep your mouth shut. Don't talk. But you, yeah. you imagine you're at, you're pulled over by a police officer. The police officer walks up to your window. How do you not talk? 
Hmm. So I had to like that. That was after the book. I kept, have to, have to having these questions, and I came up with I don't have it handy, but the fair DUI flyer, which is you keep the window rolled up, hmm. and you hold a flyer up to the window that says, "I remain silent. No searches. I want my lawyer." Three wow. fundamental, three fundamental okay. constitutional rights. I remain right. silent. Right to remain silent. No wow. searches, and I want a lawyer. I want my lawyer, not a lawyer. I want my lawyer. Okay, hmm. that's the fourth, fifth, and sixth amendment rights. Now the cop is there. Like, what does the cop do with that situation? Right. So, and why, why are we doing this? Why are we keeping the window closed? Because every DUI traffic stop, uh, the police officer writes down in his paperwork, I detected the strong odor of alcoholic right. beverage emanating from the vehicle. Gotcha. Yep. If the window's yeah, closed, he can't claim he smells alcohol. If you don't, mm-hmm. he says the, the driver had slurred speech. If you don't speak, he can't say you have slurred speech. Mm, um, okay. So they, they have certain things that they look for and you're taking this away. So there's an interesting question. Do you have to roll down your window at a traffic stop? I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't mm-hmm. think the courts have addressed that question. And I think it's an interesting if question. If you're not following the officer's instructions, they could just see that, can't they? What, what, I'm sorry, what instruction is he giving? Roll down your window. Give me, so, your, give me your registration. So he wants to search inside my vehicle without having probable cause to believe that there's something wrong inside my vehicle. This is, this is the Fourth Amendment they, question. They can't ask for your license and... You're you hold the license up to the window so they can see it. See. Why do they need to hold it in their hand? Now, here's the thing. Most people hearing this are going to say, just do what the cop says. What, what, what part of the Constitution do you, why do you hate the Constitution so much? I have rights. I'm asserting my rights. It's, it's, you're supposed to be secure in your person, papers, and effects, right? Well, my license and my registration and my insurance are my person and myself are person, papers, and effects. I don't have to hand that over to him unless he has probable cause to believe I've committed a crime. And where does he get probable cause to believe I committed a crime? By smelling inside the car and listening to my voice and determining yes, I've sure. slurred speech. So now. I'm trying to intercept yeah, yeah. that point. So yeah. this is this is sort of like more of like an intellectual exercise because people, a few people actually got the flyer. Now, some activists got the flyer who were not drunk mm. and did it in checkpoints. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I did it in a, mm-hmm. in a couple of checkpoints. You tried it. Yes. Drunk people don't follow the instructions. (laughs) So they roll down the window and they hold up the flyer and they say, you can't arrest me. (laughs) So all the advice. It's cool that you did that. All the advice in this book, all the advice in the flyer, it it, it doesn't help drunk people because drunk people don't follow instructions. I was literally, I literally have a friend who was was an attorney who advised the New York State Police. And I told her, you should just train the cops. They, as long as they know the instructions on the card, if they see the person isn't following the instructions on the card, that's a sign of intoxication. Mm-hmm. There you go. You've got your probable cause. And that's right. I got you. So if you're, oh. if you're, you're not trying to weed out the people who were truly but are. It didn't uh, fundamentally uh, matter because very few people took the card. Very few people used it. Of the people who were actually not activists who understood the game, yeah. they didn't use it properly anyway. So it was kind of a fun exercise, but it didn't had no impact on the world of drunk driving. Yeah. Well, you know, Warren, I mean, I think the story of your life is that you don't follow um, just a certain path. You will take chances. And so you, you've, uh, you've now uh, wrote this book. Tell me about uh, running for governor. Sure. Um, and- so 2007, a friend of mine asked me to run with him for town board in our town. And What's a town board? Yeah. It's like the local legislature for the town. Of, it's the, town, it's the, le- the legislature Council? for the town of Gilderland. It's like a city council, town it's board. A, it's a town. I got you instead of town. I live T O W N, T O W N. So yeah, I got you. So gotcha. we ran. Um, we won. So we got two seats out of five. So yeah, I was active, and I had been active as a libertarian for a while. I was ran as a Republican. I had yeah. been a Democrat for years. I ran as a Republican with him. Um, we got on the town board. We asked some good questions. We had some good impact. We you know, we didn't accomplish as much as we hoped for, but we did keep spending and control. And we, we caught them on some tricks, the, the yeah. Democratic majority and some bad things they were doing. Um, and then I was talking to some friends about the libertarian race in 2010. And I think I was saying I wanted to run for attorney general. I said, no, we want you to run for governor. So I ended right. up running for governor as that a libertarian candidate for governor. And mm-hmm. uh, it was a lot of fun. And there were some up and down moments, but uh, it was entertaining. I did I got three times as many votes as the guy before me, three times as many votes as the guy after me, double the votes of anybody who had ever run for governor before. So, and I'd spent like $25,000 and and had a pretty successful result considering I only spent $25,000. Had a great, great, some great moments in a debate with Andrew Cuomo and 
uh, mm-hmm. Carl Palladino, who was the Republican candidate. And I, I call the, the five of us, the five dwarves. Um, <laughs> the other, there were five of, five of the rest of us. And it was a lot, it was a lot of fun. We had a good, it was a good time. And if you, could, you, you, if you search for, debate. if you search yeah. for Warren Redlick governor debate, you'll find some videos. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's, a, that's look a for, thing. look for yeah. Warren Redlick Q7. That's, that's yeah. my, that's, that's the one that the libertarians like the most. Yeah. Q7. Um, and so you're a libertarian. I, uh, just very quickly, don't spend the whole time. I know you've got a whole new cha- your uh, the daily line. You have another YouTube channel that's focused on your politics. That's that's not a YouTube channel. That's a locals plat. That's on the locals platform. Locals, right? Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. awesome. So you, yeah, so libertarian's been where you've been in that philosophy for position for since then, 2007. Well, I'll I'll, I'll make it really simple. Yeah. Um. Government, people people look at government as a solution to problems. I look at government as the cause of the problems. Mm-hmm. So if you look at inflation right now, government is the cause of inflation, right? Inflation is a huge problem in America right now. A, lo- a lot of people look to government to solve problems when government actually causes problems. And, um, you know, to me, big government is is the biggest, like, like we talk about Tesla. What's the greatest, when, pe- when people talk about, well, what's the greatest threat to Tesla? What, what might, what, you know, it's competition isn't the threat. Government is the threat. People always say, well, Tesla shouldn't grow in China because the Chinese government. Okay, so government's a threat. We look at, you know, Joe Biden attacking Tesla and the Democrats attacking Tesla, Alameda County attacking Tesla, um, Tesla constantly, the German government making it difficult for Tesla to open a factory right. in Berlin. The, the, Tesla's biggest problem has always been government. And, and, and mm-hmm. you know, you and I believe that Tesla is the solution to a lot of problems humanity faces, right? And, you know, government is holding up the orbital launch of Starship, Right. Mm-hmm. We, you and I think that Tesla is the solution to problems and government keeps getting in the way. Mm -hmm. So do you want, and and fundamentally, you can look at it from this perspective. If you go into philosophy, right, the the underlying philosophy of of United States government, the the history of the formation of the United States government, it was this notion of the social contract, right? And the consent of the governed is a phrase that's used. So I'm going to ask you a simple question. Tell me something you like doing that you consent to the government stopping you from doing, including the use of force, including putting you in a cage or killing you if you do it. So tell me something you <laughs> like doing that you consent to the government stopping you from doing. Or alternatively, tell me something that you don't want to do that you consent to the government forcing you to do. And the answer to this in both cases is, well, nothing. I want the government to stop other people from doing things I don't like them doing. I want government to make other people do things I want them to do. Nobody consents to be governed. We want other people to be governed. Yeah, for sure. Oh, and that, yeah. I consent to it if I'm going to do something that's going to harm a lot of people. But you don't want to accident. harm people. So, I don't, but it's accidental. So you're not, you're not consenting. <laughs> you're not consenting to being stopped from doing something you want to do. You're consenting to being stopped from doing something, to do something you don't want to do. Sure. So that's not okay. consenting to uh, anything. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Like I said earlier, that's, it's great sure. to hear that. Sure. It's not the forum to do it, but yeah, thank you for that. I appreciate it. I mean, it tells me a little bit more about, uh, again, what I love about you is you're very intelligent about things, but you also don't just necessarily follow straight uh, the line you you carve your own path so how did you make all these changes in your career you you've uh, you've even launched your own website you're on a book you had a policy you ran for governor how did you decide to leave law and actually become a youtube or start becoming involved well with Tesla? when i moved to florida i was mm-hmm. leaving my i i essentially was leaving a, a law practice that i had in new york that I, I wound down over time. And I did become a lawyer in Florida and I did try to build up a practice as a lawyer here, but I didn't get very far. And I didn't try as hard as maybe I should have, but I didn't succeed in building up a significant law practice. I mean, I still had cases mm-hmm. here and there, but I didn't have a high volume. Um, I mean, just last year I had, I, I got some money handling a DUI case and you know I, I did a good job for that client. I've, I've, done, I've done a few cases, but like, like last year, I just really started to feel like I just didn't have it anymore. And mm-hmm. ni- 2019, I made my first video about, because I, I had a YouTube channel for years that I didn't really yes. focus on. And then 2019, I made a video about Starship that did really well. And I was like, okay, let me make some more videos. I made another video. I made another video. All of a sudden, I was making money as a YouTuber and enjoying it, right? So I made some more videos, and all of a sudden, it turned into I'm a YouTuber. And, <laughs> I'm a YouTuber now. And and I that was taking time away from, you know, that was, that was more enjoyable than being a lawyer. Being a lawyer... Honestly, I don't, I enjoyed it when I was younger at a certain point, the conflict just got to be too much for me. 
Um, mm -hmm. It's so comical because I'll have conflict on Twitter or YouTube and people are like, how do you handle the <laughs> stress? That's like nothing. <laughs> Let's, yeah, try getting yelled at by a judge. You know, the, getting some random, you know, guy, you know, Gary Black's mad at me. He, he can't hold me in contempt, you know. <laughs> It's the, so the the conflict that we experience as YouTubers and tests on yeah. t on Twitter is nothing compared to the conflict in a courtroom. So, um, so and I had just to be clear, I had over fifty jury trials. So yes. I, I did a lot of work as a trial lawyer. You know and that's a lot. That's what yeah. people don't realize. That most lawyers have no jury trials. A lot of lawyers have a few jury trials. Very few lawyers have more than five or ten jury trials. I had fifty. I, we can tell the way you talk and yeah. the way you think is very much a lawyer approach. Yeah. That's why it's hard for me to be on the other side with you. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so, so you, you started with Starship. Why, why Starship? What got you to decide to do a video well, on that? Are you I was so a fan. Excited? I was a fan for a while and I was watching videos and I, you know, Elon mentioned something about an 18 meter diameter Starship, which mm. I called Starship 2.0 and no one else was talking about it. Mm. So I made a video about something that I thought was important and I, it got like 60,000, I'm making up the number, it got 60,000 views. Wow. And then I, I realized that. First. I realized that I had a perspective to offer on yes. the Tesla SpaceX community that you do. that was different. Not not to say that it's better, right? It's not to say that I have something more to offer than Dave Lee or Rob Maurer or Golly <laughs> or or uh, Stephen Mark Ryan, right? It's just I have my own perspective on things. I actually joke with Stephen Mark Ryan, by the way, that that I don't watch his videos because he's he's he says the same things I do, but he's funnier, right. better looking, and younger. So. <laughs> So like, I, exactly. like well, why would I watch him? It makes me feel <laughs> inadequate. But, you know, I, I feel like I offer a somewhat different perspective. I have a different way of coming up with my answers. And, and I add something in that way. And it doesn't have to be that I have the best channel because I don't think I do. I think I love Rob Maurer's channel. I love Dave Lee's channel. Um, it's just and I, I, I was inspired by Golly, right? You know, okay. hi, hi, hyper change. You know, that, that there, there are channels that like... I got excited about what they were doing. It was like, well, wait a minute. And now, you know, I liked them early on and I, I saw what they were all doing. And like, okay, I just have my own take. And at a certain point I had it like, it was like burning in me. I got to tell my version of the story. Nice. Okay. So let's go back a little bit. When did you first hear about Tesla, Elon or SpaceX and what got you going? Who did you meet first? When did you start Twitter? Sure. I don't, I don't remember exactly when. I got into Tesla and SpaceX, but I was a PayPal customer. I, I generated over a million dollars in revenue with PayPal as an attorney. Uh, as an attorney, okay. You know, online, yeah. people paying me to handle yes. traffic tickets, criminal cases, whatever. Yes. I took a lot of payments online with PayPal and with PayPal. Google Google yeah. Wallet or whatever they called it at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I watched, uh, somewhere along the way, I became aware of Elon. I became aware of SpaceX. I watched the launches. I, I was aware of Tesla. And I just sort of followed tech a little bit here mm -hmm. and there. And I don't remember exactly when, but I started watching more and started watching more. And then I got excited about it. You know, Everyday Astronaut, mm -hmm. huge fan, Scott Manley, Marcus House, Dolly. Um, now, you know, there's a lot of channels that I was watching. And then, like I said, this moment happened and I, I made that one video. And then you asked me kind of a broad question, who I met first. Mm -hmm. I don't know what in you Twitter. mean. In Twitter. Usually people sign into Twitter. Oh, okay. So, to, so my yeah. Twitter account is WR4, the number four, NYGOV, which is Warren right. Redlick for New York governor. So it's a legacy account. It's not really like made for this space. But it was like, all right, I actually have another account called Traffic Court. I have another account called West Boca News. I probably have a fourth or fifth account out there. Um, oh, Fair DUI is a Twitter account as well. But I think... WR4NYGov was the most engaging, had the most following. So I just stuck with that, mm -hmm. with that as my account. Now all of a sudden I have 35,000 followers on Twitter. Yeah. Um, but I don't, I don't find Twitter nearly as important as YouTube. Like I, I'll tweet something on Twitter and I'll get some engagement, but my YouTube videos get way more comments than I get replies yes. on, on Twitter. Yeah. Sometimes I'll, you know, sometimes you have a hit on Twitter, right? And you get, you get a, especially if Elon replies to your tweet, right? That's the one I've had eight replies from Elon, not in a while. Wow. But Elon replies to your tweet and your tweet gets, you know, 2 million views, uh -huh. right? Millions of people see your, your, your tweet if Elon replies to it. But um, I find YouTube to be more important than Twitter. Twitter's just fun. And Twitter is, for me, Twitter is more a great source of information. Mm -hmm. And it's a good source of sort of networking with other people in the community. But it's not, uh, and I, I, I follow Twitter because I learn what's happening on Twitter. You know, Troy Testlike is a great account to follow right. on Twitter. Exactly. Gary Black, even though I often disagree with Gary, it's a good account to follow. Um, you know, whole Mars blog tweets like, I don't know, a hundred times a day, but you know, <laughs> 
you you Great get info. you get good information from you get good and bad information from Twitter, but you can sort of sort out what's the good information and what mm-hmm. can you work with to then build something off of. And obviously, yeah. Elon is a critical follow. Yeah. Okay. So you, the, the Twitter, then you, YouTube. I agree with you. YouTube. I mean, obviously, I'm not there yet, but you. It's a community that you've established, and I see that you do these live streams, and you're getting thousands of people. So. That's an, a great way to communicate and connect with people. Yeah, well, what it turns so I my started off with edited videos. Like I, you know, I have an idea I want to talk about. Let me put together a video that explains it. Let me put together some graphics that explain it. And then right. somewhere along the way, I tried doing live streams, and it got a lot of engagement. So what happens is you have an audience, and the audience likes to watch your prepared videos, but they like the engagement with the YouTuber. Yeah. So I, you know, that, that part of having the conversation, your most loyal fans, they want to engage with you. They want to, they want to chat with you. So yeah. I find that a mix of the two works really well. The, the live streams are easier to do The The edited videos are hard because you got to edit. Yeah, very hard. You don't have to edit a live stream. So, um, editing is like the hardest, <laughs> hardest part. You know, you, you, you make a 20 minute video, it probably takes you five hours to edit it, but mm-hmm. you can make a two hour live stream for two hours. <laughs> You know, with that, an hour of prep, right? Yeah. Maybe a few I, hours I think of prep. the reason you're quite successful too is that I, I, you're very open, you're very transparent, you share a lot of information about your life and what you're up to. Is that always been your uh, personality? I think so. I, I, I don't, always been I'm not way? self-aware enough to realize that, like, I, I just am who I am. <laughs> I, I have noticed that other people are a lot more, a good... constri- I've noticed that a lot of other people are more restrained. I didn't think of it that I was different for being open. <laughs> I'm just me. I love it. I love it. I gotcha. Okay, so of all your YouTube videos you've done, uh, which is your favorite? Do you have something that you really enjoyed making, or just, or they're all just the same? That just, just get them out. Stream of consciousness, as Dave Lee calls it. Well, they're not stream of consciousness. They're they're consciously thought out videos. I, I made a video like ten industries that Tesla and Elon and SpaceX will destroy, or yes. something like that. And that yes. the first version, I made a second version thinking, well, it did really well the first time. Why don't I make a remake? And the remake did not do nearly as well. Um, mm-hmm. I think that video is over 400,000 views. And I think it's... Well, yeah, it's, I saw one, your most popular is 407,000 views. And that's the video, Tesla Super Batteries, Millions of Miles. Right. Okay. So maybe the other one has 250,000 views. I forget how many views it has. But to me, that video, people aren't thinking further down the road about what happens. So, so people know like if Tesla bot comes along or, or robo taxi destroyed, people see it destroys jobs, which is a misunderstanding of what it actually does. Right. I mean, dishwashers destroy, right. automatic dishwashers destroy jobs, mm-hmm. but nobody wants to go back to not having automatic dishwashers, right? Mm-hmm. Destroying jobs frees up people to do more high value added work just to cover that point. But, you know, in an era, just an example of the, the industries that, that uh, RoboTaxi destroys, for example, that RoboTaxi is one example. RoboTaxis aren't going to have accidents or they're going to be extremely rare. So what did I do? I was a criminal defense and personal injury lawyer. So it wipes right. out DUI cases. It wipes out personal injury cases, right? It destroys. I, I know everyone is crying at all the lawyer jobs that will be lost, all the lawyers that are going <laughs> to suffer, all the personal injury lawyers. The fact that you're going to stop seeing personal injury lawyer billboards on the roads and and ads right. on TV for personal. I know I know you're all really upset, and the, and the structured settlement ads are going to go away. I know you're all upset to hear about all this destruction of industry, and all these jobs that are going to be lost. Everyone's crying for the lawyers. I know that's going to happen. So this is one example. You know, think about all the medical work that is done right. on car accident victims. And if we don't have car accidents anymore, how many how many how much less burden there is on the medical industry? <laughs> this is ridiculous. And, and, but th- this is the example of like, if you're thinking forward and you're saying, okay, when this happens, when the cars drive themselves and they don't crash, right, they don't hit pedestrians, you know, how many lives are saved, how, how much less work is done in the medical field, how much, and, and how much less work do the courts have, right? If you eliminate speeding tickets and drunk driving, like Palm Beach County, where I, where I, uh, where I was living, Palm Beach County processes, the courts handle 15,000 traffic tickets a month, right? That wow. requires staff, that requires mm-hmm. lawyers, it requires, you know, there's all kinds of all things that are police, going on there. Yeah. Police time, you know, what do our police do when they're not writing traffic tickets anymore? There's, all, there's, there's It's a game, yeah. it, there's so many changes that happen in society when robo-taxi happens and people just haven't wrapped their heads around it. And they, I think they don't want to wrap their heads around it. So that, I, I you know. really a fun topic. You yeah. know, and if you think about, um, 
Hyperloop and uh, Starship Point Earth to Earth, like you're basically wiping out the commercial airline industry. And if if uh, Boring Company Boring does a does a tunnel through the Bering Strait and starts delivering cargo from China through this tunnel, then you eliminate Trans Pacific shipping, right? And if hype if uh, Starship goes, you know, point to point on Earth and you you probably wipe out you could have another tunnel for passengers, you know, um, and that could wipe out you could wipe out commercial aviation entirely, mm-hmm. uh, which is which is great because commercial aviation is bad for the environment, se- sensitive to weather, all these other things. So there's so many different ways that, that so that that video was kind of very forward thinking. I love it. Very. Fun. So to answer yeah. that was a long answer to your question, but I think that video was no, very no, forward. It's a great thinking. video. I, so I should be doing you go on YouTube, 10 industries. If you go on YouTube, 10 yeah. Industries, Tesla and Elon Musk will destroy. I'll watch that one too. That's the stuff that gets me excited, the future. I love to yeah. you know, th- think about that some more. Okay, well, let's talk about the future and your future business. So um, you have this idea and I believe that you are now, tell, tell, tell us and the viewers here, because I think I'm pretty close to all your plans, but share with them what, what led to this position where you're now rearranging your life it seems like in the last year, and now you're considering starting a business, a pod car business. So I'd love to hear. Right. More so there's two that. things I'm doing right now. One is I'm uh, moving to the Canaveral area because I want to be closer to SpaceX. Right now I live about three hours south of that, and I want to be closer to that. So it, just pause for a second again. This is such an interest of yours, such a powerful passion of yours that you are moving your. You're deciding to move your location where you live, there. Well, it's partly that, and partly I'm sick of South Florida, so. It's not quite that simple. Okay, and, good, and, good. and I don't know if you want, you want to talk about that later or now, but I, I got divorced and I, it sort of freed me up. And, and I'm like, well, where am I going to be now that well, I'm let's free? Let's talk about that now. And then I, yeah. I do want to get to the hard car business. But sure. I, want to, I think it's important for us to understand what's happened to you and all the changes that has happened to you that you're now even willing to make a well, bigger change, which is a brand new business. Let me just address it this way. Yeah. I'm 56 years old. A lot of people, when they get in their late 50s, are starting to think about how they're going to coast down the hill. Right. We, we all we we all start off at ground level, sea level, whatever. And some of us climb hills and some of us climb mountains. In Elon's case, he climbs in the entire freaking planet and beyond. Right. <laughs> but we all, to some extent, climb certain hills or mountains. And eventually, at some point, we end up back at sea level. OK. Right. That's my met one of the metaphors I like to make. So a lot of people at my age, 56, are starting to plan out coasting down the hill. Mm-hmm. Right. They're going to retire and they're going to coast down. They're going to play golf and they're going to, you know, walk on the beach or whatever and, you know, retire to a retirement community. And I retired once at 45 when I moved to Florida and I, I didn't, I did, it didn't take, I, I want to climb more mountains. And, um, my, you know, I, my wife and I grew apart and we, mm. she's a wonderful woman. We, we talk frequently. Yeah. Um, she's supportive of me. I'm supportive of her, but you know, fundamentally we just grew apart and mm. I think she wants to coast down the hill and I want to climb mountains and we just right. not, and there's a lot more to it than that, but obviously there's a lot more to it than that, but you know, I, I think we, we didn't fit anymore. Mm-hmm. And, um, so I moved out and I'm living in, in, uh, Coral Springs right now. And I'm, I'm moving, I'm moving out of this apartment tomorrow, this condo tomorrow. Um, but so my, my plan is to move up to the Canaveral area. Where, where am I going to be? Well, a lot of people in the Tesla community were suggesting I move to Austin and mm-hmm. I like Florida better. I like the humidity better. That's a long conversation. Um, mm-hmm. I have daughters and I want to be closer to my family and yeah. being in Florida Thanks keeps so. me closer to my family. So there's a bunch of reasons for that. Even being closer to my ex-wife so that, because, so we can support each other. Yeah. Um, so Canaveral is just a great spot because SpaceX is going to grow like gangbusters. So I want to be part of the SpaceX community as much as I can. So that's part of it. Um, and then, so that the plan is number one, I'm going to go in a little more deep on my YouTube channel. I'm, I'm currently in negotiations on, a particular office space that I'll be able to use to be, which has a balcony that has a view of launches and it's got, yeah, I can be able to make a a little mini YouTube studio out of it and invite other YouTubers to come over or other people in the community to come over and can watch launches from the balcony. We can work on videos together. I haven't fully thought that through, but I have that idea. And then the other thing that I'm working on, which you asked me about is the pod car. So for more than two years, since, since autonomy day, Elon talked about this robo taxi world. And yeah. to me, it was obvious that the the optimal robo taxi would be a single passenger vehicle because something like eighty percent of all traffic is one person going from point A to point B, including when an Uber driver True. is taking somebody from point A to point B. There's really only one person in the car who's going somewhere, right? Yeah. 
So the optimal robo taxi would be a single passenger vehicle. So a Tesla Model 3, let's say, which is the most efficient Tesla currently, is about 15 cents a mile. Maybe it's 18 cents a mile, maybe it's 15 cents a mile, something like that. And the future robo taxi they're going to make, maybe that's going to get down to 10 cents a mile. But what you have is, um, number one, they weigh a lot. They use mm-hmm. a lot of batteries. They have a lot of frontal surface area. So when they're going through the, wind, the, the air, they have to push a lot of air out of the way. Right. So the typical car is six feet wide, five feet tall. It's roughly a 30-foot rectangle. I'm oversimplifying, but it's roughly a 30-foot rectangle that you're pushing through the air. The pod car, in my vision of it, is roughly three feet wide by four feet high. Maybe it's four feet wide by three feet high. I have different versions of it, but it's about a 12-foot rectangle that you're pushing through Mm -hmm. the air. So you're down to about one-third of the frontal surface area. The weight, um, the current one of the engineering designs I have, it weighs about 500 pounds. Car weighs about 4,000 pounds. So you have a lot less mass. Could probably get by with a 10 kilowatt hour pack instead of a 60 kilowatt hour pack. So mm-hmm. you can make a lot more robo taxis if you, if they're if you're battery constrained, right? We were talking about battery constraint earlier. If you're battery constrained and you can make a vehicle that only has a 10 kilowatt hour pack versus a 60 yeah. kilowatt hour pack, you can make six times as many vehicles. Right. So you can really populate the robo taxi world if you have single passenger robo taxis. Makes sense. Yeah. And I think a really good use for it, for example, might be the boring company tunnel system. I rode in the the Las Vegas boring Las Vegas Convention Center boring tunnel system. And number one, you could theoretically have two vehicles going side by side in the tunnels if they're three or four feet wide. Because the tunnel, I think the road deck is four is 10 feet wide. Um, and number two, the stations are the real bottleneck and the bays where the cars pull in have to be a certain size to accommodate a Model Y, let's say. But if the vehicle is much smaller, then you can have more bays and you can get more throughput. If most of the rides in the boring system are single passenger, right, Mm -hmm. then a single passenger vehicle is going to be optimal for the boring company tunnels. And people don't realize how big, boring company is going to be ridiculously huge. Um, It's going to like totally, like that's another example of what's going to totally change society that people aren't thinking about is um, the, the, the volume of traffic that's going to go through these tunnels is going to be crazy. And so that, and then delivering the, the, the sustainable transportation revolution to poorer countries, to um, middle-class people in poor countries, right? How, you can't get there with a, a robo-taxi ride that costs 25 cents a mile. They can't afford it. That's still too expensive for them. But if I can deliver that ride for a nickel a mile, then, some of the, then, yeah. then I can expand the sustainable transportation revolution from a hundred million rich pe- people in the rich world or 500 million people in the rich world to another few billion people in the middle class and the, in the middle world and poor world. And so that's the vision. I talked to a friend, a, a, a neighbor from Brazil. He thought it would do well in Brazil. I've talked to people in India and Egypt. You know, there's the challenge of can a robo taxi navigate these, these difficult roadways, right? But if it's better than human, it's better than human. If the human drivers in India can handle it and it's better than human, then it'll do it. It'll handle it as well as an, a Have human driver in India. Of, um, Tesla and Doge. Do you know that guy? Dogecoin? No, no, his, his uh, Twitter handles Tesla and Doge. I've heard of um, him. He he just moved back to Pakistan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. launching a new business. It's an electric rickshaw. I, I talked to him. That it's a ro- yeah, it's not a robo taxi, um, single passenger, but it's the concept is an electric. Rickshaw. So look, first of all, the odds are I'm going to fail, right? I'm I'm dumping my own money That's in. At some point, I'm going to try to. At some point, I'm going to yeah. do a crowdfunding round, but. Um, yeah. what I see is people, whenever I talk about this idea, people always say, what about this? What about the BMW Assetto? What about the, mm-hmm. you know, the Arkimoto? Arcata, they, they're always talking Arcimoto. about some other, uh, mm-hmm. small vehicle that they've seen and, and they don't mm-hmm. get it all. I, I don't know about Tesla and Doge's vehicle as well. I've talked to him about it, but I don't know exactly what he's going for, but I've mm-hmm. seen a lot of these other vehicles and a lot of these other vehicles are designed to be driven. Yes. Right. And when you design it to be driven by a human, it's mm-hmm. a completely different design. The pod Absolutely. car is designed, no steering wheel, no yeah. pedals. Wait, it gets bigger. No doors, no windows. I people agree like, with you, by the people way. People like, how do you do no doors and no, no windows? No, no, you have, I agree you, with you. Your no clamshell windows. opening. That yeah. doesn't mean you don't have some sort of transparent sh- yeah. transparency on the shell. I, uh, that was one of my controversial ideas as well, very similar to you, that I but, think that the but dedicated now, robo-taxi that they're making is going to be a single stamp. And the, right. exactly his vision and that's what, you know, your, in order to be cheap, it has to be that. And then you have all, all, uh, right. monitors inside. So you can see outside, but it's uh, right. But the, the key, the key points are if you, if you don't have windows and doors and you have a lot less structure and you have a lot less interference with the aerodynamics, 
So you can get way below a 0.2 coefficient of drag combined with your lower frontal surface area and you're going 70 miles an hour and you're getting insane efficiency. And the goal basically is a Model 3 right now can do about four uh, four miles per kilowatt hour. Yeah. So I think I can get to 20 miles per kilowatt hour. If I cut the frontal surface area in third and I can make the coefficient of drag better and I can make the mass a lot lower, you, may, so maybe it's a stretch. Good. And then the only other bit is uh, user experience, right? They need to f- not feel like they're walking into a coffin. <laughs> they got to feel comfortable. And well, they feel like they can, they don't feel like they're cramped, all that kind of. You do want to make it so. somewhat comfortable, but I would, you know, basically say that if you look at what people are riding in, in poor countries today, it'll sure. be better than that. So is your target, the first market you think will be some other country, not the U.S.? Or? My vision is the first mar- market is probably somewhere in the Caribbean, like the Dominican Republic. Dem- okay. I choose the Dominican Re- Republic in particular because I believe they have the highest traffic fatality rate in the world. Um, and if we can, if we, you know, basically the idea is it's going to be built in Florida initially. Can I identify a Caribbean country, which is close to Florida, that's so willing you're to- You're going to beat the cheap, the cheap de- labor and the cheap delivery of, you know- What labor? Yeah. I mean, well, if you want it, I don't know how. Oh, would I build it in China this. instead? No, no, not building it. I, I thought market as in selling it, right? So people are going to use your. Well, we're not going to sell it. We're going to operate a fleet. That's what I mean. Um, you're you're selling the product well, to customers. Not so, that they're going to buy it. They're going to hail it and they're going to use right, it. Right. It's, it's it's an open question. Can we deliver a, a, a not just a vehicle, but can we deliver a service that people will take? And like for know. well, the reason I say that is in the Philippines, for example, I can order a DVD of a movie. And it's delivered to me by a guy on a bike and he on a motorcycle and he delivers it for like less than a buck yep. uh, US dollars. And are you going to we'll do it for 20 cents? Robo taxi? Prob- yeah, but even then, you know what I mean? Like it's so cheap, it's hard to do it there versus, you know. Well, but you're wealthy. So when you're only paying a dollar for that, a dollar isn't that big of a deal to you. But what about the, the yeah, poor people and what about the poor people in the Philippines? Is a dollar a lot to them? Yeah. I don't know. You, it's it's very easy to look at this from the perspective of a wealthy person and say, well, I don't need that. It's not about you. It's about people who have less money than right. you and I. If, if you have a market, obviously, it just I, you have to look into it. That's really cool. So where are you at with this idea? That you've you've obviously spent two years putting it together. You've no, no, no. I've spent, spent two years talking about it. I yeah. would say the last few months I've been putting together a plan, and now I've pretty much settled on a plan to build a prototype, yeah. which I will hopefully get done Six months. I, there's, I don't. I there, there's a whole story there about how I'm going to get the prototype done. Yes. It's probably longer than you want to talk about. But <laughs> I, I will hopefully have a, a a sort of working prototype that at least looks the part that I would then be able to use as part of a, a pitch to crowdfunding round to raise five million dollars. And once I have raised the five million dollars in a crowdfunding round, which Boxable did a crowdfunding round for five million dollars, and I think I will have a more compelling pitch yeah. than they did then. Oh, for sure. Yeah, that's not going to be. And then. Problem. If I have $5 million, then I can hire an engineering team. And one of the nice right. things is, since the target for the pod car is to have a production cost of $1,000, mm-hmm. right? which sounds crazy, but there's if you watch, um, Jalopnik has a video where they bought right. a, ni- a $900 Chinese car, Chinese yeah, EV. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? So I, it's, I think it's attainable. I, I, to- I, I actually like the idea uh, because I think that you're going after a market that I don't think Tesla's going to do. I think you can oh, be able to. I specifically license. talked to two high ranking people at Tesla who told me we're not yeah. doing that. They're not going to do a single, they're not going to do a single person. Right. And, but like you say, if you look at the streets and the, you know, HOV lanes, they're all one person yeah. in the car uh, and in traffic. So that might make sense actually. And right. you're, so there's a very specific but, need. But here's the point. And the if I raise $5 million dollars and the target is to make something that only costs $1,000 to build, right. and we yeah. get to the point where we have an engineering design and then we yeah. want to build some. It doesn't cost that much to build them, so we can build a hundred of them, and then keep right? iterating the design until you get something where, right. Where, like, if you're Rivian or you're Lucid, yeah. you and you're building right hundred thousand dollar vehicles, you're yeah. co- you need to raise a lot more capital. I can do a yeah. lot with five million dollars where other yeah. companies can't. Boxable is fifty thousand dollars minimum per via so per, per home. Falls nicely in place for you. The um, obviously what you're relying on is the Robo Taxi license. Um, and that seems like it's 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 going to be there because that's you know they've talked about that. that I, I did to talk it. to somebody highly placed at Tesla about that possibility, and it's something I, they'll at least consider. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I didn't talk to Elon, right? But I talked to somebody fairly <laughs> you will. highly placed. You will, man. Um, so cool. And then, you know, I do have in the mind that there could be a use case where we put a st- where we we have a joystick control, and you make it a toy, right? And okay, so I, yeah, I so worst case scenario, it becomes a yeah, gotcha. Well, I mean. 
if it's able to go 70 miles an hour, you know, you could see where this could become a toy that people would pay money for. So I, I, that's sort of a backup plan. But, you know, I yeah, do yeah. think the robo taxi, I think that either Tesla licenses self-driving software, or we wait five years and license it from whoever's next. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, they will. They will license it. Yeah. Interesting. I love your enthusiasm and your, I'm a three time startup founder myself. So I'm um, all, all for people with vision and gumption to try and give it a shot. You don't have the answers, um, well, but that's the way it is. <laughs> this is about that climbing mountains thing again. So yes. I'm 56 years old. Ballpark, I have 20 good years left. So what am I going to do with those that. 20 years? Right. <laughs> well, I can, I can coast down the hill and, and play golf or whatever, but I, I get bored playing golf. I want to do something. I want to try to build something. I, I've been, I was blessed or lucky to invest in Tesla at the right time that I have enough money to play around. Right. And I, don't, I live fairly cheap. I don't need to spend a lot of money on myself. I mean, of course, I'm yeah. driving a Plaid Model X right now. Exactly. But, but other than that, I, I see you. I'm, you. You've talked about well, how you're very frugal and you're, or you're not frugal. Just you don't really need a lot of things. You know? No, I cook for myself. I don't go out to yes, eat. Sir. I don't drink. I don't smoke. Yeah. Um, I, I stopped chasing women. So <laughs> I thought you were. Let's talk about no, that. No, I stopped you're chasing pretty- women. You've been, wait, you've been pretty vocal about this, this search for a, you know, explain that a little bit that you're searching for a wife, a new wife that's going to be in, uh, you want to have children. You've got two great daughters. I know that talking to you, you, you're a great dad. So tell us a little bit. So (laughs) I, um, we, when we got at this point where I realized the marriage was in trouble, I started thinking about, okay, I'm definitely not happy the way things are. I don't think I'm happy the way things are going. Well, what do I want for the rest of my life? Mm. Yeah. And, and one of the things that I look back at what I've done in the past and I raised, mm-hmm. I participated in raising two daughters. I, I played a fairly big part in, in raising them and they turned out really good. And I really enjoyed doing everything from, you know, people like, oh, you don't want to change diapers. Yes. I want to change diapers. I, I like exactly. changing. I liked holding my babies and changing their diapers and mm-hmm. putting, you know, fe- late night bottle feedings and driving them around when they wouldn't sleep and, you know, mm-hmm. all of it. I mean, were there moments where I was stressed out and wasn't happy? Sure. But, you know. 99% of the time, 90, 90 yeah. plus percent, maybe yeah. 99% of it. I loved it. And my daughters turned out great. I, I, I could go on for hours about how proud I am Love of them. Mm-hmm. Um, th- there's so many good things about them. I was like, well, why wouldn't I do that again? Yeah. And you know, every, a lot of my friends think I'm crazy because you know, <laughs> I, your age, you want to do that? Like, yeah, that's what I want to do. And I initially started out with the idea that I was going to find a woman who's under 35, because if you right. want to have kids, it matters how old a woman is. Yes. And I learned fairly quickly that the vast majority of women under 35 don't find a 56-year-old man attractive, or at least don't find me attractive. <laughs> um, and I'm not, you know, I could get LASIK, and I could do surgery to get rid of the bags under my eyes, and I could get a hair transplant like Elon did. I could do all those things. Yeah. Or I could say, screw it, I like who I am. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I did, you know, use dating apps, and I did, I did, I still right. theoretically am part of a matchmaking service. Yeah. But I just found fundamentally, I'm not, I don't think I'm going to find a woman I'm going to be happy with. And not, right now I'm on the theory that I'm going to hire a surrogate. Uh, this is the sure. joke. The joke side of the surrogate thing is a surrogate costs about $100,000. A wife costs like a million. So <laughs> That's probably true, actually, if you think about it. That's, that's why funny. it's funny. And then um, if, you, if, I, if I have a child as a single father through a surrogate, then I can't lose custody. If I get married and have kids with right. someone and that you get the odds, risk of divorce is very high. Wow. in general, then I, you know, substantial risk of losing custody. So if I have kids as a single dad, yeah, then I can't lose custody. I love this. So wow, that's, this is brilliant. So you that's, are, that's yeah. probably, so the plan is fall of 23. I buy a house, the timing of, of selling the marital home fall of yes. 23. I buy a house near Canaveral and then I start working on the surrogate or some other way of having children and, and while you know, building the thing the about that is you, you're not rushing anymore because it's really not the age of your wife anymore right well the dating was just absolute hell i mean the dating apps are absolute hell um when i did have dates it was absolute hell uh, i did have a girlfriend for three months that was fun for a few weeks and then that was absolute hell like um yeah, the world hard, yeah. the world changed from when i was younger my so, i'll say this about my ex-wife uh wonderful woman uh, she was great to me. She was a great wife. She was a, uh, a great mother. Um, I wish I could find someone like her who was under 35, but I don't think they right. exist. And gotcha. if they do exist, they want a guy who's 20 years younger than me. Yeah. So whatever it is, I'm not finding her. And I, I've just accepted that. I, I, I can't say enough about how 
how positive I feel about, even though she's my ex-wife and we got divorced, it wasn't an angry divorce. We got along together. We continued to get along together. She's a wonderful woman. Nice. I love it. I mean, I met you and I've gotten to know you uh, for the last six months. And I think that um, I, I love to see the progression. And I just like the way that you have a goal. You're very clear whenever you have a goal. It's something you know about yourself. You said that you're not self uh, introspective, but you you really are because you know you know yourself. I don't see you waving so much, but then you'll change and you'll redirect um, and you'll reevaluate. So that's really cool about you. Uh, some fun conversation questions, uh, just quick to get to know you a little bit better again. Do you have a hobby? Is there anything that you do? Consider a hobby other than Tesla, <laughs> like me. <laughs> I go to the gym every day. Yes, I think you do. That's right. Yeah, I mean, it I takes went up to a lot of time. I, 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 there, there are times when I have to take a break from it when I'm traveling or something like that. Uh, right, I still try to go to the gym when I travel, but um, yeah, I mean, I don't. I would say shooting because I do have guns, but right. I actually don't do that very often. I don't really enjoy shooting. I just think it's important to. To have this to, yeah. If you're going to have them, you should know how to do it. Um, you should know how to shoot accurately and how not to shoot when you shouldn't shoot and all those things you should train. Um, I used to be, a, I used to call myself a prepper. I think I'm still a prepper, but I don't put a lot of time and thought into it. Um, really, I'm just, I'm like all in on following what's going on with Tesla, SpaceX, Boring Company, it. Neuralink, Elon Musk World, other tech stuff. Um, and I guess a hobby was chasing women. And I gave up, I gave that one up. <laughs> Gotcha, gotcha. I constantly... Well, you pick something up. I'm friends with Ellie. You know, if you know the Ellie and Space Channel, I'm friends with, yes. that, with Ellie. I actually talked to her today. And I constantly hit on her in the hopes that someday she's going to decide she yeah, wants me. But it's, not, she'll, it's she'll, not working. So she's she, hashtag... She joined me in one Twitter space one time. And I'm hoping she'll join again. Yeah, she's, yeah. she's hashtag not my girlfriend. No, that's the... Damn it. Uh, okay. So you're, you're pretty reflective about what you're going to do in your future. So if you could ask your future self one question, what would it be? Ask my future self one question. What would it be? Whew. Let's say thirty years from now. I, I don't. I think you're giving yourself. What could I do? Twist. What could I do better now? Oh, you, you don't. You don't trust your own gut. You don't trust. Uh... Well, my future self knows. Yeah. <laughs> my future self knows what I could do. What I could do better. Uh, well, if you could ask your past self one thing, if you could tell your past self something, what would you tell them? Um, I suppose it depends what year, but my typical right. answer to that is either buy Microsoft stock or buy Apple stock. <laughs> so, but you did buy. The typical Amazon question is your the typical question is your eighteen year old self. Yeah. Well, no. So, like, I at, about investing. I think one of the biggest lessons I got in investing mm -hmm. was for the longest time I'd been believed in diversification. Right. And I'm and I joke that I'm diversified now because I own Tesla and multiple accounts. Exactly. That's what I say. But exactly. 2013, I bought Amazon. I, I got Amazon. I, I, I was addicted to Amazon Prime. I was checking out the website every day and I was an early adopter. And I figured, wait a minute, this is going to blow up. And I bought Amazon stock. Mm -hmm. And it, mm -hmm. from, the, from the time I bought it till the time I sold it at 13 x Yes. And okay. buying it was the big, when I bought it in 2013, it was the biggest investing mistake of my life because I didn't buy enough. Yeah. I should have bought a lot more because <laughs> no, I saw yeah, it yeah. and I didn't get it. And so then when it, when it came to Tesla, I got exactly. it and I bought a lot. Exactly. I still didn't buy enough, I but it. I bought a lot. I mean, exactly. now I bought enough. Because I'm yes, pretty much all in. Exactly. But when I yeah. started buying, I should have bought more. But um, if you look at if you had bought like Microsoft, I forget it was Microsoft or Apple in 1984, you would like 2000 X. Yeah. Uh, so I got Apple very early and I became a full Apple fanboy. Everybody knew it. And I invested heavily and I eventually went all in Apple. Yeah. And then I discovered Tesla and since 2012. And now I'm all in Tesla and that I actually moved all of my Apple to Tesla. And that yep. was a tough call because Apple's a strong company with incredible cash flow. With and it's got some good growth ahead of it. It will double. That's what I say. It will double and triple for where it is now. But yep. Tesla will 10x. 10x, 50x, 40, you know, 50x, I, well, yeah. We said at the beginning of this call. So, yeah. So I did that. But, um, yeah. So if you, uh, what is that? Well, last question here is what's a moment you realize that you were wrong? <laughs> and what was the cause of that epi epiphany? <laughs> I just remember a moment when I was arguing with a friend and like I, I was probably an online argument and I realized he was right. And I 
said, you know what? You're right. I was wrong. I have to rethink what I was saying. And he got mad because he was enjoying the argument. Um, I think, like I said, <laughs> I, 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 but I, I don't remember what the subject matter was. Um, I, I think actually that moment with Amazon, you know, when I realized it had 13 X and I looked mm -hmm. back and I said, I should have bought more. I think that's a really good example. I think, mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, we're wrong so many times in life. It's hard. It's hard to piece yeah. back and pick one like big error. I, I I'll tell you because you we were talking about personal life and you know my brother just passed away. I don't think we talked about right. that. Yeah. Um, I chat, yeah. And I was haunted for days with the question, and it still actually hurts. Was I a good enough brother? Like, could I have been better to my well, brother? You were. Well, so I definitely. I think my brother was happy with me as a brother. But I look back and I think, you know, I don't think I respected mm -hmm. him enough. I don't think I, you know, and we did a lot in the last two years together that I think got better. Yeah. But I look back in the past and I, I think that I, I don't think I was as nice to my brother as I should have been. I don't think he cared. I think my brother was very happy. I just be clear. You know, I talked to his, his wife. You. I talked with his wife about specifically this feeling. And she's like, no, no, he thought you were wonderful. But I look back and I say, I could have been a better brother. And I feel that way nice. in general that there are people I could have been better to in life. Yeah. I probably could have been well, better you know, to my I, wife. I met you, um, I, I don't know, I don't know how long now, six months, and we've been talking a lot. Uh, we met through Clubhouse. Yeah. And then I met your brother, Steve, uh, on Clubhouse. And he is such a nice, gentle soul. But what I was really struck with is the way that you treated him on the calls. You have deep respect for him. Uh, it came through. That's what I, I had already picked up on even before this. Well, so that's, that's when we're in public. That's when we're in public. <laughs> you know, sure. you know, siblings fight in private, you know. It's... Of course we all do. But I mean, uh, obviously, but you know, like uh, we all really admire you that you invited him to be your plus one to the, you know, Gigafactory party. That's pretty cool. And we met him there. So. <laughs> yeah, no, I, look, uh, that's... we, we did a lot more together in the last two years. I think Tesla brought us together a bit more. Yes. But um, no, I, he was a great, bro he was great to me. That's the thing. Like he was really, really good to me. Like for years, for, you know, from the very beginning, from teaching me math, helping me learn math when I was a kid, um, right. always supported me. Always. So, uh, I think that if I have a, you know, at the, because he just passed, I'm yes. like, could I have been a better brother? What could I have done to make his life better? <laughs> Did I listen to him enough? Did I respect him enough? Was I, was I, was I kind to him? And like, I think people saw me being nice to him publicly. They didn't see what it was like behind, you know, sure. behind closed doors or whatever. And I, I think I could, that's, that's, it's like haunting me a little bit. Like I could have been better. Mm -hmm. And I, and like, I don't feel that way about my daughters. I feel like I was a great dad. Yeah, you did I, great I job, don't, yeah. I don't have regrets about how I raised my daughters. I feel like I was very good to them. I mostly think I was good to my wife until mm -hmm. I think maybe we just set, you know, fell apart and could I have saved that in some way? Maybe, I don't know. But uh, with my brother, it's like, that's the one that haunts me. Like even my mom, like I take care of my mom. Right. And my brother appreciated that I was the one taking care of mom. But I look at that and yeah. I say, could I have done more? You know, I, I, I feel Again, like I'm, I'm... Yeah. With I, your mom, I'm very impressed with you because I know that you've, you've said that she's got Alzheimer's or dementia yeah. and she doesn't even recognize you anymore. And yet you visit her quite often and you actually move to be closer so you can visit her often. And yet she doesn't even recognize you anymore. So that, that really is very touching and very, you know, it says a lot about you as a person actually. So. Right. But I'm just saying cool. like, so I think I'm good to my mom. I probably yeah. had a little bit of more fights with my mom. I definitely argued with my dad a lot, but he loved arguing because he was a law professor. Yes. But I, I seriously, like I look at my relationship with my brother and I'm like, mm. I could have been better. Yeah. Like I, that, that's, the answer to your question, like, the, where did I realize this wrong? Like, I could have been better to my brother. And I think I got better later in life. So I feel a little bit better over yeah. the last couple of years. But still, you know, like my brother would suggest something with mom. And I was just like, no, we're not doing that. And I wasn't. <laughs> sure, sure. I think I feel like my tone with him could have been better. But he just didn't care. Like, because I was his little brother. So it didn't matter. That's the thing. From his perspective, I'm his little brother. Who cares if Warren sasses me? Mm -hmm. He's a little shit. Who cares what Warren says? Sorry for exactly. the language, but no, 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 yeah, that's good. So, I mean, this is a, a, a cool way to kind of uh, summarize everything here, but you are 
a person who is introspective. You absolutely, you know, you, you said you're not, you just live your life, but you are living your moment. You have a true north. You actually know what you want to do and then you're willing to go for it, just like the pod car idea. You admit that it fail, it could fail just like Elon did. You think it's an important thing. It excites you. Uh, I think you should try it, like you said. And I can't, it can't, I I can't let it go. It's actually no. that... It's it it grabbed hold of me when he, at Autonomy yeah. Day, and I kept I've talked to somebody yeah. really really high place to Tesla. Okay, like not Elon, but like one step below Elon. Someone yeah, you've yeah. seen, someone you know, who just said, "Yeah, we're not doing that. You know, that's yeah. not gonna that's not worth doing. You know, yeah, maybe it would increase the road bandwidth, but he did, he just didn't see it." And I talked to another person at Tesla and, and I just like, well, if they're not going to do it, and I, I've been talking about this, like, exactly. I see it. I see that it will work. Like, I may be wrong, right? But I see that it will work. I see that this is the future and no one else is going to make it happen. So damn it, I'm going to make it happen. Yeah. I don't use if damn it. I use, I use the, I use the F still word. still passionate about it, I think that means that you should do it. But now it's like, it now it's like, okay, I've, I've got plans for how to make it happen. Right. Um, I'm waiting to get a couple other things settled because I'm, I'm moving. Right. And, and I'm going to be in limbo for about six weeks and then I should be settled somewhere. And then I, I know where I'm going. Now. I, I like kind I had plans to hire somebody to build a prototype. Right. And I just couldn't get somebody to do the work. I was like, I was going to pay somebody fifty thousand dollars to do the work of building a thousand dollar car. Yeah. And I couldn't get them to give me a proposal. And then I figured out I just figured out another way. So I'm going to pursue this other way of building it. Get the prototype built. If I can raise the five million dollars in the crowdfunding round. Then I got lots of money to spend on hiring a real engineering team and, and going forward. So, well, it's very, very exciting. I mean, lots of changes in your life. Um, recently I, I should say and... also, if Tesla stock 10 X is between now and then, I don't need the of engineering course. team. I just do it myself. Exactly. No, exactly. I, mean, I don't need what... the funding. I don't need the crowdfunding around anymore. That's what's happening. And that's, it's cool that you and I both share the same philosophy that we're not looking at the stock next month, next quarter. We're looking at it one year, two years from now, three years, from five, now. So 10. That's where 510. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Well, whenever it comes to Uber Bull Ward, I'm on top of it. I love you, buddy. You're awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Politics aside, but everything else, I love it. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's good talking You're to you. You're awesome. Uh, it's always great to, uh, hearing your opinions. You're just uh, well full of knowledge and wealth. And I always learn something. So thank you guys. Thank you, Warren. Um, everyone, if you're not already, please follow Warren on Twitter and on YouTube. More importantly, as he said, you can look him up at Warren Redlich. Hopefully, hopefully you learned something. And if you did, please subscribe and like. And Thanks, check out everybody. the merch at ElonBits.com. Right. Elon Bits. ElonBits.com. There you go. I love that. He's got some great shirts. You got to pump the, the merch. That... <laughs> this, this is probably backwards, but it's discriminate Kojitandi and it means critical uh, thinking. You need to get one that says uh, first principles thinking. In Maybe. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thanks, everybody.